This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 7th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why oil's new, quote, competitive analysis, close quote, of Prop 1 dodges key points. Second, we discuss why both no on one and yes on one are misleading in their ads. And third, the problematic 2019 Buckeye report resurfaces with the same exact problems it had before. And now, let's join Michael. Let's start off with number one. Oil has done a competitive analysis of the uh, Proposition 1, which, of course, is the oil tax, and Commonwealth North had uh, had a, uh, a slideshow presentation on it and everything else. Let's, uh, let's talk about it. Well, last week uh, on Wednesday, Commonwealth North hosted an online uh, event, and the, and the video and the PowerPoint presentation is up on Commonwealth North's website for, for those who are interested in diving down into it. Uh, the title was Alaska's Competitiveness in Global Oil and Gas Markets, and it was a presentation by uh, uh, an analyst at IHS Market, uh, used to be uh, uh, CIRA, uh, Cambridge Energy Research Associates, um, that, was, that was looking at Alaska's position in the uh, in the in the world and how Alaska and how uh, Prop One would would affect that. Um, it was. It, it, I don't think it proved what uh, what what oil wanted it uh, to prove. Um, it, it it showed that that certainly that Prop One increases uh, costs to Alaska and in a in a and in a static world where no one else is increasing or decreasing. Uh, it moves Alaska's competitive position uh, down some. Uh, you would, ex- I mean, you would expect that if you increase costs on on one uh, factor and you don't do anything else to any of the other factors, uh, then the fact the 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 category that you've increased the cost on is gonna is gonna change relative to everybody else. It did it did show that, uh, but but here's what it really didn't do. Um, it divided the world. It divided the North Slope rather. Um, into two categories. One it called greenfield uh, 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 developments and the other brownfield developments. And this is a common term uh, in, uh, in, in the real estate industry. Uh, greenfield means uh, development in an area that hasn't been developed before. Right. Brownfield means uh, uh, development in an area that's already developed uh, and you're just doing additional incremental things um, in that area. And so it divided the world into greenfield and, and, and or divided the ANS into greenfield and brownfield and focused on the impact of Prop 1, uh, said it was going to focus on the impact of Prop 1 on those two areas. They're both, they're both significant in Alaska. Uh, greenfield, we do have greenfield developments. We have the Willow development, Conoco's Willow development out of the NPRA, and we have uh, – uh, 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 Oil searches, uh, Pika development uh, on state lands. Uh, we also have brownfield developments. We have Prudhoe and, and Kaparik and and uh, in other areas that have already been developed that that will the Prop One would uh, affect the costs on. Uh, and uh, and it you know so so both of those both of those categories are relevant. But when they but when they looked at each category, they they sort of they sort of came to conclusions that I don't think are really helpful to the to the no on one side. 
with with respect to greenfield developments, uh, they looked at they chose they chose the size of these greenfield developments they were going to look at, and they looked at a 500 million barrel uh, new greenfield development and analyzed the effect of Prop One on on that development. And what they showed, uh, and again, Prop One doesn't apply. The tax rates in Prop One don't apply until you get to a certain size, certain level of production, both historic. Uh, production as well as as well as ongoing production, and and what they showed was Prop One wouldn't apply to greenfield developments, the the representative size development that they used, until the 18th year uh, of development. It showed a production curve that went from year one uh, production comes online to year 27, uh, when production uh, declines to the point that uh, presumably. Uh, uh, the field is uh, is being is nearing shut in, and they show that Prop One doesn't apply until the 18th year. Well, anybody who believes that that the Prop One that the oil tax regime we pass with Prop One is going to still apply 18 years from now, uh, I think, is really not followed Alaska's history very well. We'll probably go through two or three more oil tax changes before we get to the 18th year. So if you're if you're expressing concern about a greenfield development like Willow or or Pika, uh, and and saying you know we we really shouldn't pass Prop One because of the impact that it's going to have on those developments. Well, the impact will will never come because they're showing that it doesn't come until the 18th year, and we know we're going to have changes in the oil tax regime uh, before. Realistically, we know we're going to have changes in the oil tax regime before we get to the 18th year. So. That really isn't a very convincing reason to vote against Prop One when 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 you're you're expressing concern about something that's that's ne- never going to happen. Right on the on, on the brownfield side, uh, Prudhoe, Kaparik, uh and the others they never really analyze that. I mean they 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 say that it will increase costs and yes, Prop One will increase costs. But they don't really show what that's going to do to investment levels. They show that it's going to increase costs relative to a static world where nothing else is changing. Yes, that changes Alaska's competitive position. But it doesn't. Re- but they never really analyze what that does to to investment decisions. They try to they try to say, well, increased costs will always negatively affect in- investment decisions. That's not true. I mean, you, you've got increased costs. Prudhoe is going to have, or, or the North Slope is going to have, increased costs just from the inc- increase in transportation costs alone. Uh, over the next couple of years, uh, uh, the producers of Esta have, have projected that the transportation costs are going to go up 3 to 5%. Well, all Prop 1 does at these oil prices, all Prop 1 does is go up uh, 3 to 5%. So it's not, there, there, there wasn't anything in this that said, if you increase, um, uh, if you if you if you pass Prop One and have these increases, that the brownfield developments, the developments inside Prudhoe and inside Kaparik uh, and inside Alpine, which is the other field to which Prop One would apply uh, immediately, that the developments inside these fields will, will stall or never never get to, ne- never be taken. The the analysis they did on the greenfield uh, uh, projects. You know, analyze big dollars that, that you have to put into um, uh, put into these projects, um, and said, you know, in year 18, it's going to you're, you're suddenly going to be getting less return out of these out of these big investments. The investments you make in the brownfield projects are much smaller. They're incremental investments. You've already got infrastructure uh, in these existing brownfields in Prudhoe and Kaparik and Alpine. You've already got existing infrastructure. You've built. Well, you're, you've built a, 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 a pipelines, you've built processing facilities, you've already got those. So what you're talking about are f- relatively small, certainly compared to the greenfield projects, relatively small investments. And yes, Prop One's going to layer on some additional costs uh, to those investments, but there's no, they, they make no case that uh, that those investments are going to be suddenly become uneconomic or not 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 made. Uh, uh, because uh, because of Prop One, so it was an interesting analysis. IHS Market does a great job; they're they're great analysts, um, and and you know they were sort of shooting fish in a barrel when when they're analyzing the effect of 
of increased costs in Alaska when they're not, you know, changing costs anyplace else in the world. Right. Uh, and, and, so, and so, yeah, Alaska becomes less competitive. But it wasn't, it, to me, it wasn't a, to, to me, somebody who's been, you know, in the industry 30, 40 years, it wasn't a compelling case that all of a sudden Prop 1's going to going to send Alaska spinning off, uh, spinning off into the abyss. Almost counter, uh, almost counterproductive at that point. I mean, again, showing, uh, you know, the, the fact that, yes, you're right, over 18 years we expect that the political landscape will change the taxation structure at least two or three times. Uh, and when you're looking out that far, I mean, doesn't it show at that point that really some of those, uh, some of those changes or some of those uh, effects of Prop 1 will actually be minimal? Yeah, it, I, I mean, it, 18 years when you're doing a net present value on a new project, the 18th year really is is sort of beyond uh, uh, beyond significance. I mean, focus on that for a second. 18 years, we're saying by in 2038, it's going to start having an adverse impact. Well, 2038 is a long way a long way out there. Not only is the not only is the tax regime going to change uh, a couple at least a couple of times before uh, 2038, but other costs are going to change, and other people in the world. Uh, other other uh, regions in the world are going to do different things. It's just not um, it, 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 it's just not a compelling case that that Prop One is going to spin Alaska off into a off into a a, 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 a situation where these investments aren't going to be made. And and just for clarification, I mean, you have made the point that yes, that all all of these levers, no matter which lever you pull, is going to have an impact. Uh, in the future. Now, whether Prop 1, uh, whether it passes or fails, there's going to be an impact. If it passes, there will be an impact on oil investment uh, down the road in the future. But if it doesn't pass, then again, we have a larger hole to fill uh, this $2 billion deficit with. And so there'll be other lovers that, again, that will have to be thrown on that. They'll have The revenue will have to be generated from someplace else. So, I mean, really, it is a situation where something has to be done. You're trying to pick the least impactful of all the choices out there. Yeah, exactly. And and the question, I mean, we'll, we'll sort of get to this in the in the second segment. But the question that Prop One really raises is, should oil be part of the solution to our fiscal situation? I mean, oil essentially, by opposing Prop One, is trying to take a pass. They're trying to say, no, whatever we're contributing now is enough. We're not going to contribute any more. Uh, uh, sort of exempt us from 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 being part of the solution to the to the to the situation, and you know as we talked last week, if you pass Prop One, it can be amended. It can be amended at any time. That's, that's what the Constitution says. So you can if 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 you have some rough edges on Prop One that that truly are affecting near term investment, and truly are is uh, going to cause problems uh, uh, for investors in Alaska. Uh, then, then you can change those. You can you can file those off. But you have you have oil at least participating in the in the in the in, in making a contribution to the to the fiscal situation we face. So it's um, I mean this was sort of billed as this is where oil is going to kill Prop One. This you know the competitive analysis is where oil is going to kill Prop One, and it just didn't. Uh, right. And 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 now we you know okay so yes it's going to increase costs a little bit. Um, when you assume a static world, yes, Alaska is going to look a little bit world, uh, worse. Uh, but you know, is 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 that so big a thing that uh, that we shouldn't make oil part of the have them part of the solution? Uh, and the answer is no. I don't think this analysis said oil shouldn't be part of the solution. Joseph says in the chat room, which I had to chuckle about because I think that's the way a lot of people feel. He said, uh, "I'll be living in my Savannah, Georgia house in 2038. I don't care what they do." And uh, I think that's the way a lot of people feel at some point. I mean, I think that there are a lot of people in this state today who aren't planning on staying in the state uh, long term. And they're like, yeah, I mean, it, there's a short term versus long term scenario. 2038, that's a long time to try and plan out, especially on something as volatile as oil. Well, and oil and, and, and the oil industry, really, when, when, when the oil industry does the economics, um, they're realistic. They're not they're not mechanistic. They don't say. Oh, Prop One passes, and so it's still going to apply in 2038. And we're going to do our economics uh, based upon Prop One applying in 2038. They just, they just don't do it that way. I mean, they're they're realistic. They try to realistically evaluate where uh, uh, the the uh, uh, industry's headed, where the fiscal situation's headed, what might happen uh, with uh, development costs, what might happen to demand. 
uh, oil demand in the world, might, what might happen to oil prices uh, uh, in the world. And, and I, <laughs> one, thing about, one thing about oil companies, Alaska, when they look at, when they look at projects, fiscal terms are always, are always you know, viewed as, as, as something that's going to evolve and something's going to change. You make sort of a guess at where you think it's going to go. And basically, basically, what's happened over over time is yes, Alaska has pushed uh, for fairly rigid fiscal terms out of the oil companies. But when push has come to shove, like 2014, when push has come to shove, uh, and it looks like those fiscal terms might actually adversely affect uh, development and and investment, Alaska's moderated those terms and pulled back uh, and tried to tried to find a place which. Uh, uh, where uh, you continue to have good terms for for oil investment, um, and I think that's the reality that oil companies look at when they come to Alaska. Yes, Alaska is going to take a chunk uh, of uh, of what other mo- otherwise might be profits out of out of a project, but but Alaska historically has not has not. Aces was an overgrab, um, uh, but it ultimately got corrected uh, with SB 21 in 2013. Um, and, and Alaska has ultimately pulled back when they when it's looked uh, looked like they've gone too far. So I don't think I don't think it's realistic to say any oil company is going to sit there and go, uh, you know, 18 years from now uh, that Prop One is still going to be in effect. And oh my God, you know, it's going to have all these horrible consequences. And so and so we can't invest now. <laughs> We can't right. invest in good projects right. now because of what's going to happen 18 years from now. I, it just uh, I, that's not the way the world works. Well, and again, the long tails on a lot of these projects. I mean, these the oil companies are used to this kind of stuff as far as knowing that you know project life and and project planning, you know, requires them not to think in terms of uh, years, but really in terms of decades in the long run. Yeah, exactly right. And and the bigger the the much bigger question in 2038. Is not going to be whether Prop One still applies. The big question in 2038 is going to be what the heck is oil price going to be? I mean, we've got we've got a hugely changing world in terms of in terms of oil supply and in terms of oil demand and in terms of the potential for 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 uh, uh, climate change uh, limitations on the use of oil on the pricing of oil. Uh, huge uh, uncertainties around that. And frankly, in 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 the in a world where you're trying to address that, Alaska's fiscal terms are like one percent of the issue. Right. Uh, you're, you're you're not sitting there going, oh my God, I can't invest in this project because in year 18, a, a prop one's going to you know kick in on this project and all of a sudden take a take a chunk out of my profits. It's going to be what the heck's oil price going to be right. in 2038? Right. Kevin in the chat room says, what is the overstatement of yes on one? I've got about uh, 90 seconds here. Well, that's that's what we're going to do in the next segment. I mean, don't don't uh, uh, we don't want to take too much of the fun away. But, right. but basically, basically, the overstatement is that um, uh, yes on one is saying we're going to get a billion dollars or more out of the oil industry. That's that's at, at the oil prices we're at and projected to stay at. That's just not true. Right. And, and they admit that uh, when we had the, the uh, yes on one folks on the program here uh, last week. They admit that those numbers, uh, you know, were, you know, were very optimistic to begin with, and that was before oil prices plunged right into the toilet. So, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be the bigger question here as we move forward. We're moving on to number two of our weekly top three, uh, talking about how the yes on one and the no on one are all misleading. There's something, somebody, the points are being missed here. What is the overstatement on each of these? Brad Keithley continues his analysis right now. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Michael. So, no on one is is really um, painting a horrific picture of uh, of of what's going to happen to Alaska and what's going to happen to the industry uh, if uh, if Proposition One passes. The current uh, version uh, has a, a mother and her family out playing in the yard and sort of talking about how she's concerned about the future and concerned about her kids and that if uh, if yet if proposition 1 passes then then uh, the implied message is their future is uh, is going to be horrible and and uh, and there's not going to be jobs and there's not going to be opportunities uh for the kids uh in the uh, uh in in the in Alaska and that's just as as we were just talking about with the uh, with the competitive analysis that's just that's just a huge overstatement there's going to be yes there will be some increase in costs 
uh, if uh, if Prop 1 passes. But at current oil prices, that increase in cost is going to be about 3%. Uh, in overall costs, about the same as what transportation costs, increase in transportation costs, uh, are projected by the industry to be uh, over the next two years. That's not going to lead to uh, a shutdown of, of Alaska's oil industry. Indeed, as we were just talking in the last segment, uh, because Prop 1 only kicks in, in, in again, using the industry's uh, uh, own uh, uh, analysis because prop 1 only kicks in in year 18 that's not even going to affect the it's not even going to affect the judgment of whether to go forward uh with uh, with these big new greenfield projects or not and again i mean there's no evidence that the competitive analysis really doesn't provide any evidence that it's going to materially de- detract from uh investment in the brownfields in 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 prudo and Kapark. so y- y- anytime anytime you have an increase in cost anytime you have a tax People will wave their arms and say, "Oh, it's going to have all of these horrible, horrible consequences." But I, but the, but the, the no on one uh, uh, ads, uh, I think, are are, are way overstating uh, the case. There's a second no on one ad that's running right now uh, that goes through, you know, that that uh, it, it, the the backers of of yes on one are these horrible people who are trying to shut down. Uh, development in Alaska and trying to do all these bad things to Alaska. Uh, but when you parse through that ad, what they're talking about isn't the yes on one supporters. Uh, the yes on yes on one is financed almost entirely by Alaskans. They're talking about one of the um, uh, 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 nonprofits in Alaska who's endorsed or who has who has uh, supported yes on one, not not the yes on one supporters themselves. But who's endorsed the yes on one supporters, and those are people are that that side group is is supported by out of state dollars, and that side group is trying to trying to do bad things to Alaska uh, development. But that's not the yes on one group; it's one of one of the side groups. It's the same thing as if the as if you know the yes on one people ran an ad that said uh, Americans for Prosperity, uh, which is a Coke funded operation. Americans for Pros- for prosperity, funded from the outside, they're doing, they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, just rape and pillage Alaska, uh, and, uh, and and that's a reason to vote yes on one. Well, that has nothing to do with who the no on one group is. So it's these ads are really they're they're hype, hyping um, uh, the uh, the the issues or hyping uh, the things they're attacking out of out of all context. The yes on one people are doing doing some of the same things. I mean, the yes on one people are essentially saying. Um, uh, yes, on one is is important because it's going to help. It's going to it's going to fill the budget hole we have past yes on one and and all sorts of uh, and, and we take the pressure off the budget. Uh, they talk about a billion dollars that yes on one would raise uh, a billion dollars. Well, it won't. It raises about two hundred and fifty million dollars uh, at current at current oil prices. And even if oil prices go up some, it doesn't it doesn't come anywhere near. A billion dollars until uh, until way down uh, until much higher prices and way down the line. Um, so it's the, the yes on one people are hyping the the effect also. What yet what proposition one really does when you when you cut through all of the all of the stuff that's uh, going on that people are trying to hype out of it. What what proposition one really does is say oil is going to be part of the fiscal solution. We're gonna we're gonna have we're gonna pass a proposition. We're going to have a change in the oil taxes that's going to result in some increased uh, revenues uh, from oil. It makes oil part of the discussion. And when we get into the next session and when we finally, now that we've run out of savings, when we finally have to come to grips with what our, with what our fiscal situation is, oil's going to have to be at the table. I think that's a great thing. I think part of the problem is oil's not uh, uh, done a lot to push back on spending. Uh, 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 state spending, uh, oil has sort of stayed out of the of of how we raise revenue inside the state, um, and I think getting oil to the table and and having oil having a stake in the game of reducing spending, make the, having them be part of the process to try to reduce spending, I think that's I think that's a very good thing, and and as as we discussed in the last segment, uh, I don't think it's coming at great cost to oil, and I don't think it's coming at great cost to uh, Alaska oil development to pass Prop One and have them 
have them at the table. So uh, all of these ads are painting such a bleak picture or such a huge, great picture in the, in the case of Yes One. None of that's true. You, you cut you cut through to cut through all the fluff and get down to the the nut of it, uh, and we're going to have a small incremental, relatively small incremental uh, increase in revenues coming from oil as a result of Prop One, and we're going to make them part of the conversation about how we uh, how we solve our overall uh, financial picture when we get to the next legislature. So the typical campaign of extremes uh, is what it is, you know, b- boiling things down to worst case scenarios, and of course we it's our job as uh, Voters and as Alaskans, to uh, uh, you know, will uh, will will. It's our job to kind of again cut down through the fluff, as you say, and get down into it. So both sides uh, misleading. Uh, we have to find so- the truth is somewhere in the middle on that. So it is, and and I think we need to take the next couple of months, um, September and October, as we as we head toward the November ballot, to keep talking about what's really at stake here, as opposed to the the exaggerations. Uh, on both sides, so that at least people listening to this show or listening to the podcast later understand sort of the core issue of what's of what's coming out of Prop 1 as opposed to the exaggerated claims of either side. Ken asks, how much, if anything, will it cost to implement Prop 1 if it passes? Do you, you have any analysis on that? Oh, it's going to be minimal. We already have. Prop 1 just really changes the tax rates um, and the tax structure of of both uh, the gross tax that we already have in place, it changes it from 4% to 10% at, at, at low oil prices. And it really just changes the way you do the, the, the profits tax, the net profits tax we have. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a very minimal, uh, a very minimal cost. Larry asks, uh, define just how the oil industry is going to help steer, quote unquote, the spending part of what Alaskan spends. That comment is about a mile over my head, he says. Lobbyists. <laughs> Lobbyists. <laughs> Lobbyists and advertising money. I mean, so you, the oil industry lobbyists really haven't taken on costs. They really haven't taken on what it costs to run the Alaska government and helped and help look for um, uh, look for look for ways to lower it. Rebecca Logan at at at, uh, at the Alliance has uh, to some degree. But it's it's been more public facing than private facing uh, the lobbyists at the legislature. So it's lobbyists. I mean, it's it's, it's lobbyists and advertising money uh, that the oil industry brings to the game to to bring costs down. They haven't had to worry about it because they haven't had any skin in the game. Right. You put their skin in the game, they start paying attention to it. Right. By increasing the taxation and and forcing them to pay a little bit more, now they know that their 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 skin is on the line as well. And if we increase spending, then they know that we may come back to them and say, well, that 3% actually needs to be 4 or 5%. Yep. And so it's in their interest to keep the costs down in the state of Alaska. I mean, this is, again, similar to what Hammond talked about with, uh, you know, with an income tax with the people. You know, putting their skin in the game, so to speak, would cause them to pay closer attention to what's going on uh, with the spending uh, you know, uh, at the state level. Exactly right. I mean, we see it, we see it now. When you use PFDs, when you use PFD cuts to pay for government, that impacts middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20 percent and 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 businesses who aren't being impacted by lower P, by by PFD cuts, they don't care. I mean, they're not spending any time trying to reduce costs. They're just happy they don't have to pay. They're spending all their time trying to avoid paying, uh, trying to avoid a tax structure that would have them pay. Uh, once they get exposed. To, to to the cost, paying a, a a share of the cost, significant share of the cost, they will engage and and drive costs down. So it's the same with the oil industry. As long as they're out of it, they don't really care. But you put them into the game. You put the you you force them to confront the fact that they're going to have to pay money out of their profits or out of out of their revenue stream, uh, increase profits to pay for the, the government we've come to, and they will become an advocate of of reducing costs. That brings us on to number three, which is the Buckeye Report, which we've talked about before on the program here. The Buckeye Report takes a look at different forms of revenue uh, in the state, specifically talks about taxation. Uh, It has come back now, uh, and it has, again, some of the same problems that we've discussed in the past. Well, it's the same report. It's the the 29 report, 2019 report, rather, uh, from the Buckeye Institute uh, uh, done at at the request of the uh, Dunleavy administration, um, and and I, the the odd thing is I've had more calls. 
from candidates and from others about the Buckeye Report in the last uh, week or two weeks uh, than, uh, than I had at the time the Buckeye Report uh, was issued. Uh, uh, there, there, there must be a revival of the Buckeye Report going on out there that, that people are, are, uh, are pushing. So, so the Buckeye Report uh, pur- pur- purported to analyze uh, various uh, ways of raising new revenue in much the same way that the 2016 ICER report did. And the Buckeye report uh, purported to analyze the impact on Alaska uh, of these various forms of, of, of new revenue. But there's one huge difference between the Buckeye report and the ICER report uh, that, and, and the ITEP report that came out in 2017 uh, that, that, that's important. The Buckeye report doesn't analyze the distributional impact of, of any of the, the tax uh, uh, proposed tax changes that that uh, they're purporting to analyze and the distributional act pa- impact is 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 the key thing that you look for in a in a tax in a tax package who's it going to impact is it going to take most of the money from is the tax going to take most of the money from from lower income families from middle income families from upper income families who who's going to pay uh, this this tax uh, that's something that the ICER report in 2016 and the ITEP report in 2017 spent a lot of time looking at. Who pays uh, the burden of the tax? And as we've talked about before, both the ICER report and the ITEP report made clear that PFD cuts shoved the largest burden of the tax off on middle and lower income uh, Alaska Alaska taxpayers. Um, and the and the both the ICER and the ITEP report uh, talked about sales taxes as well and how they are regressive and push the bulk of the costs uh, to middle and lower income Alaska uh, taxpayers and push it away from the, the top 20%. The ITEP or, or the Buckeye report doesn't do any of that. It doesn't it doesn't purport to do uh, a distributional analysis at, at all. So all you see is an analysis of a sales tax and 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 other things that that uh, the Buckeye report takes on, but you don't see you don't see the consequence of their proposed solutions, which is largely a sales tax. You don't see the consequence of that on by 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 income bracket on uh, on Alaska families. So you you come away thinking that okay, well they've proved the case for a sales tax, for example, um, but you don't see what that does to Alaska families. My my advice to to candidates and others who have asked me about it uh, in the past couple of weeks has been, go read the ICER report and the ITEP report. They do everything the Buckeye report does, plus they give you the distributional impact, uh, and you can see what the impact of of any proposed uh, solution is uh, on various Alaska families. There's one other thing about the the Buckeye report quickly. Uh, It uh, analyzes what it calls a flat tax, but it's not the flat tax we've talked about on the program or that the ICER report talks about uh, in 2016. Their flat tax is really a payroll tax. It's what Governor Walker proposed at one point uh, during the legislative sessions why he was governor as a, as a potential solution. And a payroll tax is much different than the flat tax that we've talked about. A payroll tax really hits middle income um, uh, and, and upper middle and lower middle income working Alaska families uh, much harder than it does uh, anybody else. Again, you don't see that because the, because the Buckeye Report doesn't have a distributional uh, analysis, but you can look at the stuff that was done uh, in the ITEP report, which does talk about a payroll tax, and you can see that really who you're taxing with a payroll tax is middle, upper middle, middle, and lower middle uh, income uh, working Alaska families. But that's not the flat tax that we've talked about. The flat tax we've talked about is much closer to the flat tax that's analyzed in the 2016 ICER report. So again, the, the, the sum of it is the Buckeye report's nice incremental knowledge, but it doesn't really do at the end what you need for a tax analysis to do. You can get the same thing plus the distributional analysis out of the 2016 ICER and 2017 uh, ITEP report. Um, Brad, final, uh, final thoughts here as we, uh, as we get ready to, to roll out here for the day, what can, you know, what, what, what do folks need to take away from all this when it's all, when it's all said and done? What, you know, what do we need to be taking away? Look 
through the, I think I think the theme for the day is look through the ads, look through the fluff, look through the 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 smoke that that any side is trying to raise in a debate. And this includes the Buckeye report. I mean, look through look through, you know, the conclusions they want you to focus on and look at what the reality is, what the what the numbers really tell you and what the impacts really are. Uh, and ask that deeper question and make that deeper probe uh, to find out what's what's really going on. Because everybody, yes on one, no on one, the people who are advocates of the Buckeye Report, they're all blowing smoke to try to convince you to uh, to go their direction. What's really important is to is to work down through that smoke and focus on the core uh, of the numbers that they're talking about, or the core of the analysis they're doing. For example, in the case of the Buckeye Report, focus on that core and 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 find the truth uh, uh, buried down down within that smoke. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thanks, Brad. Um, as always, I think it's good, thoughtful analysis. I know people in the chat room don't agree with you necessarily. As I've said, I haven't necessarily decided which direction I'm going on Prop 1, but I'm definitely leaning in the yes direction at this point, uh, simply because, uh, like you said, I mean, they've got to come to the table and it's going to engage them in a way that they've never been engaged uh, recently for sure. So, uh, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Pre- appreciate you coming on board. Thank you, my friend, for being part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.